Hi, everybody. I'm Father Bill Holzinger, the pastor of Holy Trinity Catholic Church in Beaverton, and this is your Friday Reflection. Now, last week, I gave a talk on faith and science. I'm going to continue that today, but I realized as I tried recording this earlier, it got too long, so I'm going to break them up into smaller chunks. So that was part one. This would be part two, and we might have a part three and four. We'll just kind of see how that goes. Uh, you know, I was getting ready to do this, and I had a, a lavalier microphone on and was getting ready to uh, produce this, and I realized as I did some sound checks that the lavalier was picking up echoes off of the walls, and I found that this microphone, which I guess it makes sense being more of a beefy microphone than anything I've got, is doing a great job of trying to uh, cancel out all that stuff, so it sounds better. So I kind of, I'm back in the parish house uh, in the office. This is a Thursday when I'm recording this, and... You may know it's been it snowed uh, last night on Ash Wednesday, and it's quite white and Wonderland out there. And it's very very cold. Huh. In fact, it was like twenty five degrees early this morning when I walked over to the church to do mass, and uh, it's just beautiful. But I hope that you are safe because it doesn't look like it's going anywhere quick because the temperatures aren't warming up today and things are getting canceled. I see for even Friday. So anyway, I'm also using my iPhone, uh, which is a little bit better than the camera I was using. I'm using a thing called a face cam. This is it right here, uh, made by Elgato, which is great. It's for streaming. It's 1080p, where this is 4K, and it actually does a better job of light, uh, getting out light uh, and giving me better colors. And with me also is Snickers there, <laughs> good guy Snickers helping me out. Uh, he uh, earlier saw a dog pulling a man on skis with poles. The guy had a rope around his waist. He was basically being a, like a sled dog for his owner. <laughs> it's pretty funny. And I saw another person go by on skis as well. It's kind of cool. Anyhow, so back to the topic. Here we are. This is going to be part two of about faith and science. Now, what I want to remind us of, if you were not, I'm looking up my screen up here so, so I can review this stuff with you. Uh, I want to remind us that there is no real conflict between faith and science. That is being purported, and that's a myth, actually. It's always been a dialogue and an interchange of ideas because the goal of science is the truth, and the goal of religion is supposed to be the truth as well. And I'd like to propose as, as a thesis that science is harmonious with Christianity and particularly with Catholicism. And hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate that a little bit more today because I'm going to share with you people who are Catholics or Christians who are, and I say Catholic or Christians, I mean Catholics or Protestant Christians, Catholics or Christians. Uh, but I want to share with you first then some books. And these are books I mentioned last time. So How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization is the first great read I'd encourage you by Thomas E. Woods Jr. And then Galileo Goes to Jail and other myths about science and religion edited by Ronald Numbers. Those are two really great books. Other books, uh, again, it might be hard to find, The Heavens Proclaim, Astronomy and the Vatican, which is a publication of the Vatican. And another book that was written by two Vatican astron astronomers, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? Last week I said uh, alien, but extraterrestrial. And it continues on, and other questions from the astronomer's inbox at the Vatican Observatory. It's, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek in some places, uh, but they do get to go and talk about science and particularly that question, that one especially towards the end, as all leads would be, right, as they kind of bait us to read their book. But it's really great. Brother Guy Casalmagno and uh, Paul Mueller, SJ, those are both Jesuits, do a great job. Now, the two people I mentioned last week, and I want to mention them again, who really push this idea that science and faith are in conflict with each other. So if you want to be a good scientist, you can't be a person of faith. Now, there are those people, right? But I want to make the argument, if that's the case, then why are there so many faith-filled people in science? So, uh, so it's basically a conflict or a legend of a conflict. Andrew Dixon White and John William Draper are the two real protagonists in this, and I'm not going to get into the details now, but I just want to brush over them and let you just be mindful of that, and you might look them up and learn more. Uh, I know that Andrew Dixon White was uh, uh, a professor, and I'm not sure the founder of Cornell University, but anyhow. So St. Augustine of Hippo would be another person I mentioned last week. St. Augustine 
basically said that the Bible and natural philosophy do not contradict each other. Well, natural philosophy back then was another way of saying science. So that's in the 300s and the late in the early 400s. So from the very beginning, our sensibility of how we look at the scriptures has, you could say, evolved and deepened. And also science has helped us kind of realize more about what the scriptures are saying. St. Saint, uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas also repeats the same idea. He's a little more specific. He says, any apparent contradiction in uh, science or religion indicates there's an error in one's understanding of one or the other, science or religion. And I'd add, well, maybe even both. Maybe both need a little looking at. John Paul II also uh, kind of jumps into this conversation when he was writing the former uh, head of the Vatican Observatory, Father George Coyne, he wrote this. He said, science can purify religion from error and superstition. Religion can purify science from idolatry and false absolutes. Each can draw the other into a wider world, a world in which both can flourish, which is, I think, right and just. I mean, you think about it, again, their goal is the truth, right? And this is what we're after. So there's a, a link that I might, I'll put up here, move over here, um, from Wikipedia. It gives a great list of Catholic scientists, which again, I'm trying to make the argument here. If we are so against um, science as Catholics or as a religious people, what are we doing in science? Well, I'd like to propose we should be thanking religious people uh, for science, for its origin, in fact. So let me get here. See where we are on time. Okay, we're, we're doing okay. All right. So I'm going to go through some names, and then I'll need to cut it off, and we'll end this, and I'll, I'll pick up again with some other people that you may or may not know who you may have learned about in your science classes, but they never told you that they were a Catholic nor that they were a priest or a religious sister. Mm -hmm. So again, I apologize if I, if I read these names incorrectly, but I'll do my best. The first is a gentleman named Robert Groseteste. I think that's how it's pronounced. You can see the, the spelling. His dates are 1175 to 1253. He was the Bishop of Lincoln in England, and he was a chancellor of the University of Oxford. He was the first to write the scientific method. That's right. The first to write steps for the scientific method. What are we doing if we're, as faithful people, talking about science, right? Well, because we like science. Leonardo Fibonacci. Leonardo was an Italian mathematician. I learned about him as a math teacher because there's a sequence of numbers that are called the Fibonacci sequence. Because uh, amazingly enough, that sequence finds itself in things like flowers and other places in creation. He was the most talented Western mathematician of the Middle Ages. He actually popularized the Hindu Arabic number system that we use today in Western world. How we write numbers, two, three, four, all these numbers. Otherwise we'd be doing maybe Roman numerals, but he was the one that popularized those. So thank you, Leonardo Fibonacci. Here's a name you might know, Roger Bacon, right? We all know Roger Bacon, right? He was uh, a great scientist, right? Well, his dates are 1214 to 1294, and he was a Catholic. He was a forerunner of modern science. He was the first to really use the scientific method or to experiments. And he drew the boundary, he helped draw the boundary between magic and science, where sometimes people would look at things and they couldn't understand them and they would assume that it was magic. And he would argue for something different, that there must be an explanation because the world is intelligible. And so we're called by the gift of God with our minds to be able to, and to, look at those things. Hildegard of Bingham. So her dates are 1098 to 1179. I, oh, Saint Hildegard of Bingham. She was a German scientist, and we use those terms. Probably she might not have used those back then. A philosopher, a theologian, abbess, meaning she was in charge of a religious community, and a botanist. She was big in medicine, and she wrote on natural history, and medicine and composed music. She was like a Renaissance person in a way before her time. Um, her scientific books contain more than 2,000 remedies and health suggestions. So she was a big player in that area. 
Trot of Salerno. Trot of Salerno. She was uh, lived in the 12th century. She was considered the first gynecologist. She pioneered women's health. She specialized, of course, in gynecology, uh, cosmetics, and skin diseases. And she wrote treatments on women it's, as a book. It was called Treatments of Women. And uh, so you may not have heard of her, but you probably have heard of this person, Copernicus, right? Nicholas Copernicus. Nicholas Copernicus, 1473 to 1543, was a Polish man, a deacon, that's right, an ordained deacon of the Catholic Church, a mathematician, astronomer, physician, economist, and uh, a chemist even. He was the first to propose in any serious way what we call the heliocentric understanding of cosmology. He proposed, not really as science, but he proposed from uh, observation that uh, instead of the world being the center of everything, that the sun was, that everything revolved around the sun. Now, granted, we know more than this. This is not actually fully true, but for their worldview, that would have been pretty revolutionary. And it was actually quite accepted and um, wasn't a big deal uh, until the Galileo affair, which, by the way, you know, he purports Galileo is similar as uh, Copernicus. Christopher Clavius, who is a Jesuit. You'll see in the back of his name there, SJ for the Society of Jesus. His dates are 1538 to 1612. And he's a German mathematician. He headed the Gregorian calendar project and he was a friend of Galileo, huh? right? Venerable Cardinal Baronius, a cardinal of the church, a scientist. Yeah, well, his dates are 1538 to 1607, an Italian cardinal, as I mentioned, ecclesial historian and a Vatican librarian. He was a confessor to Clement, Pope Clement VIII, and he said this, that the Bible was written to show us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Did you get that? The Bible was written to show us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. So who or what field of study tells us how the heavens go? Well, we'd say science, right? Or now we'd even say specifically astronomy. And this all leads to Galileo. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with Galileo. Uh, my first take, I kind of went did a deep dive, or sort of. But I don't claim to be an expert on this. Because, it, in fact, um, if you were to go on Amazon.com and under books, look up Galileo, you'll find well over 6,000 easily uh, books on him. But I, what I want to do is I want to draw your attention to another um, resource. So I'm going to tell you the basics of Galileo, some of the basics of things. But... Because uh, he's a Catholic, right? And he actually purported, Galileo, purported that faith and science go together. They complement each other. There's so much to be said. So there's a, a, a talk or a series of talks that were given by now the director of the Vatican Observatory, Brother Guy Casalmagno, and it's called Galileo, Science, Faith, and the Catholic Church. And you can go to two different places to find this. I bought it off of a website called Learn25. That's learn with the numbers 25.com. Or you can go to Amazon. And they have it as an audio book you can, or an audio t talk you can download. And I'm looking online here from learn25.com. It's like 20 or 36 bucks. And I'm not getting any kickbacks from them, but I, it was wonderful to listen to. It's long, it's many, many hours. But boy, is it thorough. And Brother Guy even mentions how difficult it is to kind of piecemeal the things that happened to Galileo. Very dynamic. Imagine someone trying to describe your life. Uh, we're so complex. So Galileo was an Italian physicist, we probably all know this, a mathematician and astronomer, and he's considered the father of, of modern, uh, well, a father of observational astronomy, and he was uh, and also modern science and modern physics. He was the first to popularize the use of taking a telescope, which existed before him, and and put it into the sky, and or look towards the sky. Now, He's probably not the first one. I, I read something of another gentleman that actually did this before him, but didn't get the press, where Galileo did. And uh, he's been very popular to, and, and for right, rightly so, he was a, a really good uh, popularist, and you could say a social media guy, you know, I would say for, or influencer, using our common terms. But he was, he gave talks, he was very forefront, he was very boisterous, uh, he he went to lots of circles proposing some of his theories. He was able to take a, a telescope, point it to Jupiter, and actually see the moons of Jupiter, which is great, but he was able to intuit, and this is probably the, one of the greatest things about Galileo, he was able to intuit what he was seeing. 
he proposed that those were moons going around. And then that gave, it gave him the thought, well, of, okay, Copernicus also had how the Earth moved around the sun, and then maybe that was going on with all this. So this then became a controversy for him, but not because of his physics, not because of his observations. The church actually partnered with him to to want to uh, explain this to the world. However, the pope that he was friends with died, and a new pope came in who was a little bit more skeptical. Galileo was kind of a jerk as well, a little arrogant. And then clashes began, and I think it's Robert Bellerman was part of the Inquisition. He then um, was in charge of the questioning of Galileo. And we're talking again in the 1600s. So the interesting thing about this, and again, I don't go long, is then <laughs> Galileo quotes Cardinal Baronius to the Inquisition said, you know, hey, but the Bible was written to tell us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. So the real issue was about scripture interpretation. During this time, the the Reformation was uh, in full stride, and the Catholic Church was reeling from this and very cautious of anybody trying to interpret scripture. There is plenty of scripture that would demonstrate, if you interpret it literally, that the earth does not move, it stands still. That's how God made it. Uh, and yet, Clearly, the science is saying something different. So this is where you could say science corrects uh, an interpretation of a, a literalist interpretation of some scripture. So, but again, I want to encourage you to check that out. I'm going to move on after that. I'm going to go through a couple more guys, and I'm going to end it there because there's more to be said for part three. Next is Nicholas Zucci, and I hope I'm pronouncing it. This is a Jesuit. He was the inventor of the reflector telescope. That's right. So before this, it was all refractors where it was a series of lens and big, long telescopes. They would try to make them bigger and bigger. But at a point, the lenses would get so heavy that they would warp. And then, of course, you'd have a warped image. And he was, this is uh, Nicholas Zucci, was the first to really think, why don't we use mirrors instead? And they can make huge mirrors and they wouldn't have the deformity that the lenses would. So uh, good for him. He helped Kepler do research with his telescope. And the reflector, I mean, I have a reflector, and it's, it makes it, reflectors make ast amazing astronomy affordable. Uh, and that's just today. And Father Athanasius Kircher, SJ, 1602 to 1680. He's the father of Egyptology. Hmm. Yep. His, uh, na his face was actually on a, uh, a stamp in his country. Father Francesco Grimaldi, SJ, was the one that discovered the diffraction of light. His dates are 1613 to 1663. He also was on a stamp. Uh, and then lastly, I'm going to speak about Giovanni Cassini. Giovanni, Giovanni Cassini, 1625 to 1712, who was an Italian mathematician, astronomer, and engineer. He discovered, through the observation of a telescope, the great red spot on Jupiter. And because the resolution was there, he was able to define it uh, as or see it as a storm. Uh, amazing stuff. He also is known for, and this where is probably where you know of his name if you've even slightly done any astronomy or had an astronomy class. Uh, he was the one to dis to discern through observation the dividing of the two rings of Saturn. Now, at the time, that's all they could see, these two rings, but it was a very slight dark area between the two rings, and then I'll call that the Cassini division. Now, today we have, of course, satellites that have gone to Saturn, and there are thousands of rings, but from that distance, uh, that was known. So it's a, a little emptier uh, space of the rings are not so dense, um, but from the view of uh, Cassini, uh, that was a, like a gap between the rings. And when I look at the, when I look through my telescope, that's what I see because I don't, I don't have a, uh, a satellite to see those kind of details. I'm gonna break it there, uh, but we're gonna get into other people. Like, uh, let's see here. Hmm. Uh, let's see, Angelo Secchi, Louis Pasteur, Pasteur, Gregor Mendel. And others, like my favorite, I'll just say his name, George Lemaitre. If you want to look those guys up, Father George Lemaitre, you might know more. These are amazing individuals. Uh, oh, and I don't want to miss, where is she? Let's see here. Um, there we go. Sister Mary Kenneth Kell, or Kelly. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. All these are Catholics, uh, except for the one I mentioned earlier. These are people who are in science. So... What is religion doing with science, right? Well, hopefully doing good science, right? These go together. 
they help each other out. As an amateur astronomer, my, astronomer myself, I love to look into the skies. And when I look at what I'm seeing in the skies, it, it, it just amazes me what God has created. It doesn't detract from my faith. God has created everything. It's kind of like the understanding of the Bible. Again, what does the Bible tell me? It tells me the, the who and the why, where science tells me the how of some of these things. And to together, putting those together, they're in great harmony. Now I want to end here at this, and I want to let you know that if you have any questions or comments, just email me if you wish, fatherbill.org, F-R-B-I-L-L.org. You can also use my parish web or my parish uh, email, which is fatherbill at h hyphen t, and that's fatherbill is f r b i l l at h hyphen t dot org, and I, I hope you're getting the sense that these are not in conflict. There's just too many religious people, and particularly Catholics, who are in science and are forerunners of many things like the scientific method, like observational astronomy, like um, we'll see astrophysics and things like that. Um, it, we should be thanking people of faith because they're actually, it's kind of, I would call it the full meal deal. We, we talk about often about um, doing medicine and holistic medicine is probably the best, right? That's, a, a, I think, a good way to go about doing medicine, not just piecemeal things, but try to see how the whole come together. Well, this is where faith and science really complement each other in this regard. They give us a, a fuller whole sense of what it is that is God's creation. Okay, folks, I'll see you next time, next weekend. And I uh, hope to see you over the weekend at Mass if you can come. Hopefully the weather will be better. This is Thursday when I'm recording this. Friday not looking great, but Saturday, probably Sunday, would be much better. Anyhow, take care and God bless you. Bye-bye.